Okay, I picked up this book, which is um, it's called How to How to Traumatize Your Children. It's a self self hurt series. Uh, it doesn't have an author. It's by Knock Knock, which is in Venice, California. The uh, tagline on the book is, until I read this book, I had no idea how easy it could be to traumatize my children. Now they'll definitely need therapy. It's by Bob Smith, who's a dedicated father. So, how to traumatize your children. Chapter 1, Introduction, Trauma with a Purpose. All children need a steady dose of trauma in order to conduct therapy-worthy adult lives. While most, if not all, parents traumatize their children accidentally, the fact that you're reading this book shows that you love your kids so much that you'll screw them up deliberately and with skill. Rather than mindlessly repeating the trauma that was visited upon you by your own parents, you know the value of seeking improvement from one generation to the next. You understand that children need psychological peril, that they could take with them into adulthood and all future relationships. And you care enough to do it yourself. With this book and a bit of focus, you'll be traumatizing your children in no time. You'll learn how the advantages of childhood trauma will benefit your children, the dynamics common to most traumatic parenting, and how to amplify them in your own parent-child interactions, how to play to your own strengths, in choosing a particular traumatizing approach based on your natural inclinations and behavioral style. For each traumatizing philosophy, what outcomes to expect in your children, both immediately and when they grow into adulthood. Um, unhampered by den denial, you won't be surprised when your children turn out to be screwed up. Rather than asking, where did I go wrong, you'll know exactly what you did right. Your child will fit in. Because everybody is traumatized in childhood, your child will experience belonging and acceptance. During adolescence, for example, your child could forge friendships of rebellion, experimenting with sex, drugs, and piercings alongside her peers. In adulthood, your child will be able to discuss with friends his repetitive, dysfunctional relationships, wondering out loud why it is that he seeks out the same non-committal bimbos over and over again. Your child will have character. Regular adversity is like a thigh master for the inner self. And the strength arising from trauma is a hallmark of the successfully screwed up adult. The rare child who has not been traumatized has trouble handling the, the realities of a cruel world. and may crumble at the first sign of trouble. The traumatized, chi the traumatized child on the other hand, meets the world with well-developed muscles, prepared with such tools as selfishness, lack of boundaries, or a tough outer shell. Despite idealized notions to the contrary, a traumatized child is a prepared child. Your child will need therapy. Those who poo-poo therapy tend to be so mire in denial and judgment that they don't possess the courage to explore their innermost selves. Thus it falls to those who have been traumatized to seek out this resource because if individuals are not in enough pain, they will never willingly choose to attend the university of the inner self. Resources for the traumatized abound from psychoanalysts to self-help groups to psychotropic medications. The successfully traumatized can avail the successfully traumatized can avail themselves of institutionalization, electroshock therapy, and rebirthing. Those who do not believe themselves to be traumatized will never reach out to this richly arrayed support system, sentencing them to live a life that is both less aware and less colorful. Your child will be interesting and creative. It is well known at this point that most creative individuals were deeply traumatized. Your traumatized child may become a painter, musician, or graffiti artist, or might even write a memoir, the high watermark of trauma. When your child releases a memoir about her childhood, you'll know that you've done your job as a parent. Everybody needs therapy. Psychotherapy and its handmaiden, 
psychotropic medication are prerequisites for contemporary wellness. When children grow up without reasons to seek medical help, they find themselves to be out of step with their peers. In the last two years, almost 30% of American adults have either seen a mental health professional or been prescribed a drug for a mood disorder. Of those who claim they've suffered an experience warranting mental health attention, almost 40% have not received treatment. But the statistic most supportive of the decision to traumatize one's children is this. Almost half of all adults believe their parents would have benefited from therapy. Almost half of all adults believe that their parents would have benefited from therapy. Almost half of all people think that their parents would have benefited from therapy. A few parents actually believe that it's possible to avoid traumatizing their children. In a deluded effort to parent perfectly, they read books that, profe that profess to teach foolproof methods of behavior, discipline, and compassion. Unfortunately, these approaches tend to discourage the time-honored necessity of trauma and set up unrealistic expectations for a healthy outcome. When you encounter these naysayers, don't even try to reason with them. As a parent, your mantra should be, never explain, never justify. Right. Narcissism is very hip, very hot right now. Once upon a time, people cared about the community and the world they lived in. Now, however, families more frequently put themselves above the good of the group. It doesn't matter if someone else's Johnny fails in school. All they care about is their Joey. Some skilled parents, however, take this uh, typo typ typology to a new individualized level of advancement by actually putting themselves ahead of their own children. Narcissism is, one, is the one dynamic that runs through all the parenting types. When you seek nobly to traumatize others, generally narcissism comes into play somehow. Whenever a relationship does not take into account the other person's feelings, but instead is governed by one person's needs and perceptions, narcissism is present. The controlling parent, for example, is most certainly blessed with a strong dose of narcissism, as are the pusher and the best friend. In its purest form, however, the glory of narcissism manifests itself as relating everything back to oneself. Governed by the true inability to put anybody else's interests first. As you can imagine, this lack of reciprocity makes for a truly fascinating childhood. In this chapter, we'll show you why your child should come to you and relate to your world rather than the other way around. Why you should expect your child to praise and compliment you. How the threat of abandonment can elicit affection. How to lie to your children for your own good. Should you be a narcissist? If one... If no one adequately appreciates how great you are, odds are good that you're a narcissist and will excel in this parenting type. Your inflating self, uh, sense of self-importance conflicts somewhat with your need for tribute from others, and if they don't respond appropriately to your contributions, it's necessary for you to punish them in some way. Narcissistic parents enjoy one of the broadest arenas of traumatic impact because they don't put their children's needs first. As an aspiring narcissist, you should be proud to note that such dynamics infuse all the other parenting types. Indeed, narcissistic parenting takes the traumatic parenting crown. So if you find yourself in this category, congratu congratulate yourself on your choice. Narcissistic parents refer to all outside events to themselves, interpreting a child's behavior as having been intended to reject, insult, or harm them in some way. Prior to having children, narcissists have experienced this phenomena in other areas, being underappreciated, perceiving others' envy, fielding accusations that they are exploitative, and flying into narcissistic rages. It may have been challenging to conduct mature relationships with existing interactions characterized by excessive dependence and manipulation. Fortunately, children adore their parents, so your need for a claim will be endlessly satisfied once you've reproduced. Parental narcissism is one of the best ways to get the kudos you so deserve. Clarence Darrow, he says, The first half of our life is ruined by our parents, and the second half by our children. All right, so continuing on, narcissism. You will naturally gravitate towards narcissism if you exhibit any of the following characteristics, behaviors, or beliefs. 
whether in parenting or in other aspects of your life, such as work or marriage. You fantasize about um, omnipotence. You love being the center of attention. You find it difficult to understand why others struggle with their petty problems. Deep down, unacknowledged to others, of course, you feel defective. Children were born to love their parents. Children have no inherent value other than what they can do for you. Think about all you've sacrificed for them. The sex you had in order to conceive them, pregnancy and delivery, financial outlays and the challenges of keeping them clothed and fed, the fact that they interpret you all the time and seem to prefer that you weren't drunk. You've done your job and met your end of the bargain. Everything else is up to them. You deserve their love. What child doesn't adore and respect his parents? It's the law of the universe, and if you don't see that filial worship in his eyes, then he's darn well going to feel what it's like to live without his parents' affection. Because you're a superhero to him, your child must express his love for you with praise, for your personality, your perfume, your outfits, your sex appeal. You gave your child life. Now he must learn to meet your ever-shifting emotional needs. Shut up. Squelch that voice. Children are meant to be neither seen nor heard, except when it's convenient or when they're caring for you, reflecting well on you or boosting your ego in some way. Your child has very little to say about the world. After all, she's just a child. How interesting can she be? Instead, she should be basking in the fascination of your stories and experiences. Indeed, it's vital that you turn every conversation back to yourself. If they had a bad day at school, tell them that's nothing. When I was your age, and make sure they're sympathizing with you by the end of your story. If your child has an interest or concern that you don't share, ignore her until she returns to a topic that you enjoy. Indifference is a powerful tool for guiding your children without them knowing it. Conceptually, you never want to visit your child's world. Instead, make her come to yours. You have nothing to learn from her, but she has everything to learn from you. The general rule of thumb is that her interests and hobbies are silly and stupid, but yours are fascinating and worthwhile. Over time, she'll come to agree. So me the mesmer mesmerizing mirror. It's like a little section in the middle of this. Many narcissists deny themselves of recognizing their noble tradition and its etymology. The term stems from the Greek myth of Narcissus, the son of a god and a nymph who was renowned for his physical beauty. Though there are a few different renditions of the myth, of the myth in the generally accepted version, Narcissus angers the gods by rejecting a romantic interest. As punishment, Narcissus is made to fall in love with his own reflection in the waters of a spring, gazing at himself until he dies. Upon his death, the sweet-smelling flower that bears his name grows in his spot by the waters, drooping its head just as he bowed to see his reflection. While the story has anti-narcissistic roots, serving as a morality tale warning against self-love, this message is now antiquated. Since the original incident in ancient Greece, no one has died from gazing at themselves in the mirror, except perhaps while driving. Instead, it's useful to understand the story for its psychoanalytic meaning and ample degree of self-involvement and self-reference. From this perspective, child rearing can only enhance a parent's life because children are the ultimate self-reference and function beautifully to reflect the narcissist. So I got Another minute, I'm just going to keep going, fill 15 minutes. So when it's time for your child to feel emotion, don't leave this up to chance. Tell your child what she should feel and don't accept anything different. Counter any attempts at independent feelings by calling her overly sensitive or touchy. And if she persists, then go ballistic. Your needs come first. Children like to be the center of attention, but this draws the spotlight away from you. Your child should never be better looking, smarter, or more successful than you. The moment they begin to shine in a way that threatens your stardom, shoot them down. For example, when you play sports or cards, play to win, even if it involves cheating. Anything they can do, you can do better. When you're in a bad mood or have a headache, your children must not only keep their needs to themselves, they should take care of you. This is especially important if you make the parenting choice to be an alcoholic or other type of addict as you will require plenty of care, and who better to give it than your, than your kids. If your children fail to recognize the value of your needs, you'll want to remind them how important you are by bragging about yourself or by teasing or embarrassing them. Soon enough, they'll fall in line. So.
a little bit of how to traumatize your child. A knock knock series book.